40%, 45% of the American people believe literally in Adam and Eve, believe literally that the world is only 6,000 years old. Mm. I mean, that's a shocking figure, and mm. you can't duck out of it by saying, oh, sophisticated theologians mm -hmm. don't, don't believe it. Unfortunately, what sophisticated theologians believe isn't really relevant to what the majority of Christians do believe. Uh, you, you, Chris, I think, uh, Richard, cue Chris from the Evangelical Alliance, if I may. Because <laughs> you believe it's all true, don't you? I so, do, yeah. So you believe that... Um, you know, Adam and Eve and, and, and Noah's Ark. You believe, to just take something, Genesis 19.5, two angels came to, to Lot's uh, house in uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, and he was the only uh, righteous man in the village, and uh, the locals wanted to, to know the angels. They wanted to homosexually rape the angels. So Lot offered his virgin daughters instead <laughs> as an appeasement. Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah was, was demolished uh, after that, and his wife um, turned into a block of salt when she looked back. I take you believe that happened? I take my cues from Jesus, who we've already agreed. So, uh, is you, historically did that accurate. happen? Uh, I believe that I Jesus believed the Old Testament to be historically accurate. Do you believe that that happened? I believe it happened because Jesus did. So what lesson are we supposed to get from Richard. that story? What, what moral lesson? Well, well, well there's somebody well, we're missing going to come in on the to story. The moral lessons in a minute. Yeah. A fact, there's but, somebody but, missing. But touch on it now, Richard. What's well, your we question? were just told that, that what you get from the from the Bible is moral lessons, yeah. and presumably you say this didn't literally happen, but it's telling us something. What is it telling well, us? Well, the moral okay, so lesson is. So let's listen to the voice the that's missing is. in this story, which is Abraham. Yeah. Abraham turned to God yeah. and argued with God. Yeah. So the message that I get from this story is argue about it, debate about it, don't accept it as true completely. Well, why in that case, why do you... if, if you want to convey a message, which is in this case argue about it, why not just say argue about it? Why <laughs> no, wrap it up? It's about do you want to remember that message? Bishop Michael, 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 is this not, if I may ask you You don't even know what the message is, yeah. that's how obscure yeah, it is. It's a moral message uh, from, from the Bible, and of course, Richard, you, in your books you've, you've been pretty scathing about the God of the Old Testament. Um, let me just quote you, if I, if, I, if I may. The most unpleasant character in all fiction. Misogynistic, homophobic, racist, genocidal, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic. And you go on. But it's, it's quite a list. That you... I should have thought that was beyond dispute, but I, I would come on to the, to the New Testament. What about the God of the New Testament? Um, here we have a God who wanted to forgive mankind its sins, including, by the way, the sin of Adam, who he presumably knew perfectly well never existed. Nevertheless, he wanted to forgive mankind's sins. Why didn't he just forgive them? Why was it necessary to have a human sacrifice, to have his son tortured and executed in order that the sins of mankind should be absolved? Is that not the most disgusting <laughs> idea you ever heard? Why didn't he just forgive the sins? Why did he have to sacrifice a scapegoat? I think the most disgusting thing Professor, you've ever Professor heard. Professor Dawkins has a view of cheap grace. A real forgiveness comes from restitution, from cost, from sacrifice. It is not God sacrificing his son. It is his son who, in obedience to the divine will, living the divine will in a society that has gone wrong, that is corporately wrong, which is what original sin means, by the way. So there can be no let forgiveness me finish, without... Let me, let me just finish. Uh, it is his obedience in the context of a corrupt society that leads to his death. That is his sacrifice, and it is that which restores what was broken between God and human beings. So there can be no forgiveness without a death, is it? No, no, right? it's not. I'm not saying that. There can be no well, forgiveness without cost. How can you applaud that? How well, can you applaud? Because that? it's true. Well, not, not everyone applauds. Some people did. But some people applauded you. Because you know. there's multiplicity of voices, and that's mm. fine. Mm. Richard, just to come back to you, what about the, the extraordinary things that Jesus said that the, the bishop Stephen was, was talking about earlier? On, for example, you know, 
love those who persecute you. Oh, that's wonderful, of course. I mean, whoever said that, whether, whether it was Jesus or not, whether there was... But why should it not be Jesus? Well, why, I don't you know, care if it was Jesus. Yeah, it's a wonderful thing to have said. I mean, why... Jesus might have said, let him finish the sentence. <laughs> Jesus... <laughs> who, whoever said it... Why? Why should he not have said it? Whoever said it, it was a wonderful thing to say, and of course, you can cherry-pick any document and find lovely things to say. Mm. But how do you decide what to cherry-pick? You decide what to cherry-pick on the basis of what you have decided is a good thing on other criteria. Mm. So we reject the horrific story of Lot and the angels and all the other horrific stories in the Old Testament and the mega-horrific story, as I've just said, of the, of the New Testament. You pick on nice stories like the Sermon on the Mount. But the criterion by which you do your cherry-picking is, of course, something that we all share, which is we are decent human beings. That's where we get it from. But that's so we, we, we reject those other aspects of the, of the Bible which are, frankly, horrible. But in the same way, if you listen to a, a, you, you, the songs that you listen to on the radio are those that speak to you and, and speak to your heart. In the same way, that's why you pick them, because they make sense and they speak to your heart and they move you. And that's why you cherry-pick those particular ones. Of course. So, so we, I don't want a hygienic Laura. life. Yeah. I don't want a life full of things that are just nice and just clean. There's lots that's messy and lots that's difficult that is in the canon and that's was right. kept in the canon. Yeah. And also the canon developed. So from a Jewish point of view, we continually developed how we see the Bible. So we continue to develop how we see God and how we see ourselves. Mm. So actually, I think there is truth in the messy, mm. horrible stories as well. That's right. Why? I don't think... <laughs> you can find good quotations in the Bible to support the point of view that you want to, uh, to, ad to adopt. And of course you can find the exact opposite. So why not bypass the Bible altogether as a, as a source of uh, Moral authority mm -hmm. and simply say, as Shakespeare said, as Milton said, as anybody you like, you quote anybody in literature you like, and as Isaiah said or as Jesus said, you can get quotations from literature all over the place to bolster the point of view that you want to make. That's what Martin Luther King did, and many other people have done from the Bible. You can get it from Shakespeare, uh, you can get it from Milton, as I say, you can get it from, from Aldous Huxley, you can Dickens. Get it from all sorts of people. Dickens. Um, the Bible should not be given the privileged status. We shouldn't be discussing here, is the Bible relevant today? We should be discussing, is literature generally relevant? <laughs> Well, of course, you can find verses in the Bible that sanction slavery as well. You can, once again, you can, you can cherry pick. And, and why bother with the Bible at all when you can go straight to moral yeah, philosophy? I'm that extremely is a, scared of fundamentalism. The same fundamentalism that wants to convert people forcibly is the same voice as you have that says, why bother with this? What I'm concerned about is that you can't hear the different voices. Are you, you serious? Do yes. Look, <laughs> fundamentalism means tying your colours to, uh, to a particular book. And it's exactly or idea, what I'm, and rejecting exactly, everything else. Exactly yeah, what I am doing is saying, do not tie yourself to a book. Look at the good ideas, reject the bad ideas, accept the good ideas, find good ideas wherever you may find them. That's the very opposite of fundamentalism. Yes, fundamentalism is saying, he, we have here a book, we have to follow what's in that book. Okay, so I wouldn't, that's not my approach that's to Bible. That's not your no, approach. certainly not. Other other and nor the approach of most progressive people in this country. Precisely. But as a key source text on which we grow and which we develop, and Judaism has taken the Bible and added and expanded and expanded and expanded, so that our rabbinic literature is vast, starting with the Bible. But don't, we don't live in the desert anymore. We're not uh, tribes in the desert, and there, thank God, no high priests. And so I live a very <laughs> different Judaism than the biblical one. Well, of course, that, I'm delighted by all that, and that's exactly what I'm advocating, that, that we, we should not live by a book. So, and I know you don't live by the book, but I, unfortunately, uh, the vast majority but that, but of religious people in the world do. But I don't turn around and say, and therefore, chuck it all out. The language exactly. that you use... Did I say chuck that, it all you out? You said, why deal with the Bible at all? I said, why deal with the yeah. Bible as a moral text? I, I value the Bible hugely as a work of literature, uh, as, I've, as I've said in yes. my book, The God Delusion. Um, at some length. Um, so, yes.
Why is Where would we be as a society without the Ten Commandments? Well, let me, let me take up the position of the Ten Commandments. Where would we be without our Lord's summary of the law? Where Let's would take we up be... the Ten Commandments. Let me finish. Let me, let me finish. Where would we be without our Lord's summary about loving God and loving neighbor? These things are foundational to our moral thinking. Richard, where would we be without the Ten Commandments is Commandment the question. Commandment number one, thou shalt have no other God before me. Commandment number two, thou shalt make no graven image. Commandment number thou three, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord in vain. Commandment number four, thou shalt observe the Sabbath. What's that got to do with anything? Everything. It means well, humility. Well, it means, I want to say, that it means humility. The first commandment, there is a God. The second commandment, don't have other gods. What does it mean? I'm God, you're yeah. not. Yeah. Therefore, it's about suppressing our ego and knowing that I, as a human, am not the centre of everything. Precisely. <laughs> We actually no, put new are books in to... and take some of the others out. We, no, we you know. actually need to understand it and understand the fundamental thinking and philosophy behind it in fresh ways. In the light of history, yes. In the light of modern theological criticism, yes. And we need to use revelation, which I believe didn't stop 2,000 years exactly. ago, yeah, yeah. but continues in the context of the society in which we live today. That means the end of slavery, the bad treatment of women, and some of the other stuff that, frankly, is rubbish in the Bible. But how do you decide? <laughs> frankly, it's rubbish in the Bible. That's, there it's, is it's, some rubbish in the I'm Bible. I'm looking at that purple shirt of yours no, and no hearing problem. what you're saying. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 am, I, am not, I am not a Christian who finds simply my faith based on a book written 2,000 plus years ago. It's actually part of Revelation and part of my faith in Jesus Christ. But, so, so we all want to do good and we can discuss together how to, how to do good. Why would we bother to go back to a book that was written 2,600 years ago um, in order to, to do that? When you think who wrote that book, they were ignorant, they were desert-dwelling scribes. Oh. They had oh. absolutely oh. no... Oh. 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 This is, this is the arrogance of the modern world. Well, no, wait, this is, wait, wait, wait. This is arrogance, that these well, people, these geniuses who put the Bible together... Genius. Are genius. genius. <laughs> even at the level of literature, if you, I mean, why do you admire it as literature if they were not geniuses? Well, it, I admire the English literature of the... I've, I've no the Bible about the no idea about the original Hebrew. I know. Um, well, I, to, to look at the Bible and have no idea about the original Hebrew and then to say they yeah. were ignorant yeah. is frightening. Francesco. Yeah. 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 I've got to answer. Well, okay, wait, wait, Richard. Wait, wait a minute. I've got, Richard. To, I've got to answer that. Um, of course, the Bible was written in Hebrew. I was about to say when I was cut off that I have no way of judging the literary quality of the original Hebrew. I'm told. I am told that it's very good. Let Richard finish, please. I'm told that the original uh, Hebrew is, is, is a very good quality. Nevertheless, um, when we're talking about moral philosophy, when we're talking about the origin of the cosmos, when we're talking about the origin of life, when we're talking about why, why we all exist, there is no reason whatever why we should treat the, the, the writings of scribes in whatever it was, 800 BC, 600 BC, as being particularly wise. We could listen to Confucius, we could listen to the Buddha, there are all sorts of people we could listen to, and we could listen to modern philosophers as well and modern scientists as well. Once again, I come back to the point, there is nothing special about the Bible. Yes, yes, I... uh, if the Bible has any chance of, of lasting, it had better stick with the King James Version, because once <laughs> it gets turned into modern English, everybody can read it and see what nonsense it is, whereas if you, could, if you read it in the... <laughs> We've only got one minute, Laura. I say the Bible plus interpretations. Okay. The Bible as a source. Francesca. I think we cannot possibly understand Western culture and the history of Western culture without the Bible, and so for that reason... Your equivalent in 2,000 years will still be in business. I think so. I'll, yeah, I'll still be in a job, or people like me will still be in a job, yeah. <laughs> well, that's good news. That's true. <laughs> Thank you all very much indeed for taking part. Thank you all very much. Um, all the debates continue on our message board. Next week we're in Birmingham. We hope to see you there. Goodbye from everyone here in Bury. Have a good Sunday.